All right, part three, Rocky Mountain High. Let's see if I can get through this now. All right, so we just talked about uh, hung out with a weird crowd. Yeah, no kidding, man. Uh, the Beatles started it all for me. As I said, the movie A Hard Day's Night got me wanting to play in a band. It was the music of the Beatles I loved, even the early stuff such as Rubber Soul, Revolver, Yesterday, and Today. Uh, I started really, you know, I like the Beatles too. Everybody loves the Beatles, the early stuff. Let's be real though. They were like, they were clappers. They didn't do anything particularly cool. The first, first couple albums it wasn't until the mid late sixties. They started doing cool stuff. Um, I started really listening to the meaning of music, the words, as well as the sounds. Magical Mystery True was a favorite. And of course, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the apex, apex of the, you know, I think Revolver was better, but personal preference we listened to the Beatles over and over every brain cell we had which side comment probably not much considering how many drugs they were doing uh, at least while we still had a few oh he already beat me to that joke um, <laughs> all very hip and psychedelic it was a new world keep in mind that this is written by a mid mid to late 60s year old man trying to remember things that happened you know 40 50 years 50 years roughly earlier in his life so um, there's a lot of nostalgia here all very hip and psychedelic. It was a new world for a young, easily influenced mind. I was not unusual. All my friends felt the same way. We had to emulate it all. Besides, it was also the best way to meet girls. Now, sex, drugs, and rock and roll were in full swing. The establishment hated it, and my parents were at the top of the list. I could do no wrong in my mind and no right in my parents' minds. Perfect. I really believe they thought the end of the world was near. At time, as time went by, the music got louder, the drugs got better, and the home life got worse. But then my brothers had gone on to college and married. I was left home alone to battle it out with mom and dad. By then, I didn't give a shit what they told me to do or what they said. In my early youth, they had me w somewhat under control. Not now. I had figured it out. Figured out what, man? Um, it's still not really clear what he figured out to me. They had no control over me. I was doing my own thing. A little bit more context here since he's not providing any whatsoever. His his next oldest brother was seven years older than him, which means he was an unplanned pregnancy. He doesn't mention this in here, but I'm trying to give the perspective, I think, of his parents and maybe some of his other family members. You know, his older brother Jim and Larry were probably planned. Um, his parents, at, by the time, you know, my father was born, born I get the impression from talking to him and, and conversations I had with his mother at a couple points that they, they were really just keeping it together for the kids um, if that makes sense he clearly didn't understand that or if he did he didn't want to acknowledge that they had feelings and that they were going through some rough times my great my grandmother his mother I think remarried almost immediately after they got divorced and they got divorced almost immediately after my father moved out of the house so they were definitely like it was not a happy home um, as far as like what was going on or who did what when my impression from talking to my dad is that his mother was cheating on his father with um, with this other guy um, but who knows right like you know that's their private marriage business and um, but they were not happy. That much is evident just by, you know, what my dad wrote from conversations I've had with uh, a number of other people. But, you know, you read his context and from his perspective, and it's really about, you know, he's a badass. And everybody's the hero of their own story. But, like, he has idolized all these rebellish, rebellious, like, attitudes. All the drugs and conning people and and all this stuff and it's pretty typical narcissistic you know sociopathic behavior I don't think he was a full-on sociopath um, but he definitely had a lot of those strong tendencies and um, very very uh, did not care about many people um, not enough to actually like avoid hurting them he just couldn't see other people's perspectives as evidence from this book so yeah, he's doing his own thing now, and he, he loves to think of himself as like a rebel and a leader and and uh, and all that bullshit, but um, mostly just an asshole. Charismatic, fun to hang out with, good time, kind of an asshole. Um, all right, playing in bands was what I did. Somehow I made money doing it because it was a service people were willing to pay money for, man. Money for nothing and chicks for free. 
pretty standard rock and roll attitude. Um, I don't know where I heard that, but it was true. It, it's a line from a Dire Straits song. What a life. I had it all figured out. Just keep playing that rock and roll music, and sooner or later I'll be a millionaire and set for life. Yeah, no, that doesn't work out for 99% of people that you hear on the radio. Meanwhile, all my ro role models were dying. Yeah, because that lifestyle sucks. I was very fortunate to see most of my heroes on stage, although <laughs> here we go about, you know, his how cool the bands he got to see are. Um, all the icon bands of the 60s, Cream, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Spirit, Iron Butterfly, Led Zeppelin, Vanilla Fudge, can't, I don't, I don't, maybe I need to Google Vanilla Fudge and Paul Revere and the Raiders. It's a beautiful day, Quicksilver, Messenger Service, Blue Cheer, like he's just rattling off a list of cool bands, I guess, at least cool to him. Most of them I like. It's a beautiful day. Uh, I saw my second biggest influence, Jimi Hendrix, three times in 67, 68, and 69. I love that guy. Then there was the crazy organ player from the Nice. My biggest musical influence was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. So the Keith Emerson, the guy I'm named after, I guess, was the keyboard player for the Nice, and then they formed a super group called Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. When I saw them at the Denver Coliseum in 1974, I couldn't believe three guys could play that much music live. After the concert, I was completely deflated, and I knew there was nothing left for me to do in music. I really was awestruck. Of course, being on acid influenced my awe at the performance. Okay. I did keep playing, and while inspired, where did he get the, you know, I guess he was paying for these concerts and stuff from gig money, but, because I can't imagine his parents, his parents at both, some point both cut him off and uh, wouldn't support him at all anymore. I think he did a year in uh, at uh, like Wyoming University or college, you know Denver College or something, um, but then he dropped out. I did keep playing, and while inspired, that didn't stop me from the party. I actually gave, it gave taking music lessons a try, but no, too much work. Sounds about right. I tried college. That was also too much work, although it did keep me out of Vietnam. College wasn't for me. I decided to leave home and go on the road with a band. There couldn't possibly be too much work in that. This is what I thought, but boy was I in for a surprise. I soon discovered broken down vans, not getting paid, bad drugs, and bad pleas. Is there any other kind? This is a reoccurring theme throughout his entire life and something I had to learn to kind of overcome in his teachings to me, which is this like utter disdain for authority of any form. Um, I think I have a healthy um, amount of questioning authority, but like his was over the top. Um, anybody who's in authority or power is a bad person. It's kind of his attitude, or at least it was. Um, did you see the Blues Brothers movie, the first one, not the BS second one with God, Good, John Goodman? The first movie was what it was like in bands. Rented, borrowed, stolen equipment, chicken wire on the front stage, playing rawhide and hostile to hostile drunks. Uh, country bands chasing you around to kick your ass. It was right on the mark from what I went through. So, you know, it's the same story every rock and roll guy. People who try to be in bands have. You put yourself in weird drug, alcohol influence situations and volatile situations where there's money and expensive equipment. You know, there's bound to be some theft and assholes and you know, just set yourself in the right environment. That shit doesn't happen. We rolled through Alaska, Nebraska, New Mexico, Wyoming, every end of the road place along the way where we could hustle a few bucks and free drinks, not to mention get laid as often as possible. Um, you know, on that note, this guy had every STD known to mankind. The only reason we even bring that up, his private stuff, is one, is dead and it doesn't matter. And two, it's one of the consequences of acting like a whore, right? Like you have sex with random people all the time. Eventually you're going to catch um, hepatitis and God knows what else. So... You know, he, he wears that, like, again, like a badge of armor, how many people he had sex with. But, like, not, you know, as an adult, you're like, ugh, gross. Right? Badge of honor. <laughs> right. Badge of honor. Then there was the girls in a place like North Platte, Nebraska, where there wasn't much for the locals to do until the band showed up and partied. The states that seemed the dullest were by far the most fun, meaning they were just looking for an excuse to be insane. Somehow politics didn't matter anymore, not that it ever did to him, to me. Uh, it was always about the party, fulfilling my needs, desires, and to hell with everyone else. Silly me. This went on for some time. 
by now I had become one hell of a good keyboard player, but I still wasn't about the music. I was only 21 and the real party hadn't even started. All right, setting this up for big things to come. I'm trying not to be too condescending, but it's really hard. Um, I'll stop there. That's a good stop and place for this one. That's the end of chapter one. Hopefully the other chapters aren't 30 pages long. And uh, I don't think they are. So, but now maybe going to Kansas City, that's uh, where he meets my mother. And, and uh, yeah, here it is. Mom and dad divorced within a month of me leaving. So, yeah, I was right about that. All right, I'll, I'll start the next video later.